The UK government sneaks into legislation offences that you won't even know about until it's too late. Police yet again destroy the wide-eyed wonder of children who used to look up to them by descending on a 10-year-old's birthday to threaten their mum. Already stretched police are now somehow finding the resources to accompany rail workers to intimidate travellers into wearing face masks. And a court orders a report into how escaped prisoner tried to hand himself into Metropolitan Police seven times, but was turned away. This and more coming up. Don't forget these reports are daily, Monday to Friday, where possible. Please remember to subscribe and hit that bell so that you don't miss any future uploads. And if you appreciate the work I do, please consider joining the channel Patreon for as little as just £3 per month to help me continue providing this content. Hello, ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, innies, outies, and in between us. My name's Dan. Welcome back to another Pat Reports. It's Tuesday, the 29th of September, 2020. We are all too aware of the changes in guidance and legislation that the government have told us about regarding being fined under certain conditions for not following guidance. However, Civil Liberties Group Big Brother Watch have pointed out that some of these, and indeed some others you might not be aware of, were slipped out by government without any public or even parliamentary scrutiny. Some of these are simply waiting to be abused by police in what I personally can only deem as a way for the government to try and claw back some of the hundreds of millions of pounds it's dished out in failed contract bids with their friends. Obviously, we're all aware of how the rule of six works. How can we not be? It's yet another ridiculous gesture by the government to look as if they're actually doing something when in fact, if the virus was as deadly as being made out, then not even six people would be able to meet. But in with the changes we know about were some sneaky changes that put us at risk of being stitched up without even knowing about it. So here are five changes that could affect you that you didn't even know about. Number one, recklessly leaving isolation. Anyone who contravenes a requirement to self-isolate without a reasonable excuse will get a £4,000 fine for their first offence rising to 10000 if it is their second or third. That is, if while leaving isolation, they may or do come in close contact with another person, or if they are reckless as to the consequences of that close contact. May or do come in close contact with another person simply leaves this wide open to abuse. You could need to sort your head out for a mental health reason and need to go for a walk with zero intention of coming anywhere near another person. You could even go out at 2 a.m. in the morning when there is likely nobody about, but because you could come into contact with another person, that's a £4,000 fine. Number two, maliciously forcing someone into isolation will see you hit with a £1,000 penalty. One of the concerns some had about contact tracing was that people who test positive and were asked for their close contacts could maliciously give someone else's name to force them into isolation. That will now be illegal, punishable by a £1,000 fine. The new regulations state anyone who knowingly gives false information about their close contacts commits an offence. Now this again could be abused by anyone who has a grudge against you or wants to teach you a lesson for some reason and I'm not even sure how the police would know if they were being malicious or not. Although maliciously forcing someone into isolation is exactly what the government are doing to many of us. Maybe we should all put claims into the government under this regulation. Number three, tell work you're isolating or incur a £50 charge. Any staff isolating must tell their employer that when they started and will be released from their duty. If they don't, they will get a fixed penalty notice of £50. This is because the government wants there to be a record of anyone isolating, telling their employer, so that it's easier to ensure firms do not force workers to come into the office. Again, I'm not quite sure how this could be enforced. You could tell your employer verbally, but they could say you didn't and you get hit with a fine, even though you did. <laughs> Also, the fact that there doesn't appear to be an element to this regulation that penalises the employer if they fail to release you from duty. Number four, hospitality forced to stop people singing and dancing. Owners of pubs, bars, cafes and restaurants must take all reasonable measures to stop singing on the premises by groups of more than six people or any dancing. Exemptions apply at weddings and civil partnerships, but only to the happy couple. So dancing is apparently now seen as a way for COVID to transfer among people. I, I can understand the logic of the singing unless people are wearing masks, then of course it shouldn't matter, should it? I mean, after all, masks are stopping the spread of COVID, aren't they? But dancing, is COVID now a strictly judge? Will it infect you if you can't dance? What's this all about? I don't know. 
but it's a fact that dancing can see establishments penalised and you as a patron of that establishment potentially kicked out. Number five, music volume limited. Any owners of the same types of businesses have also been banned from playing music on the premises louder than 85 decibels. Performances of live music are excluded from the duty. So playing music through a system is not allowed. But getting a band in, bringing more people into the establishment to play music is allowed in a time where we're trying to reduce people's contact with each other. I mean, maybe the sound waves and vibrations will exacerbate the virility of the virus. I don't know. I certainly don't get it either. And I know some people will say, well, the music could attract people to the venue, but if they're all wearing life-saving masks, then surely that shouldn't be an issue, right? Big Brother Watch have condemned the way the changes were introduced, saying, yet again, this was imposed without scrutiny from Parliament. Where will it end? Government cannot and should not legislate every part of our lives. And one of the things about Big Brother Watch is that they have a big following. They're an organisation that's grown in support. And to be fair, is one of the things that this channel hopes to do. With more support comes more power to make change. For example, if the channel had 100,000 core members of the community and we wanted to, you know, we wanted the government to make a change or to look at changing something, we could effectively create a petition and have 100,000 signatures within days, which when dealing with time wasters like the UK government is important. The same is said for when someone's voice needs to be heard, making something go viral so that people stand up and listen is also, also of importance and is one of the goals of this channel as it grows. So keep sharing the videos to all your social media platforms. Tell your like-minded friends to come and join the community and hopefully soon will be a community to reckon with and be able to help fight back against some injustices and wrongdoing towards the real people who should be running this country through real democratic processes. And that would be you and me. Some time ago, when the Test and Trace app was announced, the UK police forces said that they would be making their own for police staff due to security concerns. Now, the National Police Chiefs Council has confirmed that police are being told not to download the NHS COVID app on their work phones, and some have been told that they may not have to self-isolate when they should be. Lancashire Constabulary, for instance, has told staff to call the force's own COVID-19 helpline instead. The source at Lancashire Police said the advice had been given because of security reasons, adding officers had, had been told not to carry their personal phones while on duty if they had activated the app. This applies to staff working in public facing roles as well as those in the back office positions. A Lancashire Constabulary spokeswoman said the health and well-being of our officers, staff and the public remain our priority. Clearly not the public if you don't want to monitor staff who might be infected but are still allowed to work and come into contact with the public. Just saying. She said members of staff, like all members of the public, are personally able to download the track and trace application should they choose to do so. Guidance provided to staff within the workplace remains in line with the National Police Chief Council position. The National Police Chief Council confirmed the work phones policy was common to all forces and said it was carrying out an urgent review on the matter. Police forces use a variety of mobile devices with different system restrictions. It is important that we have confidence in the NHS app will work for officers and staff consistently across the country and it is for this reason that we have recommended that officers and staff download the app to their personal as opposed to work devices rather than any suggestion of security implications. So in other words, the police seem to be suggesting that they, they don't think the app will work properly, which means that they don't have to download or use it, but we the public are being bombarded with adverts and suggestions pulling at our heartstrings to keep your family safe. In what I can see becoming a mandatory app on people's mobile devices in the not too distant future. Interesting how the police feel they can ignore the guidance yet again and think that they are above the rest of us. Matt Hancock has recently called the NHS COVID app the fastest download of an app in British history, having 12.4 million downloads as of midday on Monday. In Parliament, he said, I would urge everybody, including every single member in this house, to join the 12.4 million. Now, I would certainly like to see that all the government officials have downloaded the app. But of course, that's never going to happen. And we will, as normal, simply just have to take their word for it. Grasses, curtain twitchers, nosy neighbours and collaborators up and down the country are showing their true colours in recent weeks 
as more and more people are turning to stitching up their neighbours for having a family member around or going out to meet a friend without even knowing the full circumstances. A 10-year-old girl in Scotland had her 10th birthday gate crashed by Scottish blood after a neighbour called the police and grassed them up. Myla MacDonald was trying to enjoy her 10th birthday as best she could under the current circumstances when two uniformed police constables arrived. Not to wish her happy birthday, as we've seen so many times at the start of this lockdown, but to warn her mother that she was on alert and would be fined and charged if she broke the rules again. Mum, Leanne MacDonald, claims relatives had been nipping into the house to hand Myla her birthday presents. She said she could not believe it when two uniformed officers later entered her home, warning her she was on alert and would be fined and charged if she broke the rules again. She added, I could not believe it. They came to the door and told me I've been reported for having people in my house. I was shocked. The funny thing is, they actually came into my house to tell me my home was on alert and if I broke the rules again, I would be fined and charged. So the police can come into my house, but my family can't. The 36-year-old mum from Ayrshire is now on the police's COVID alert list after celebrating Myla's birthday uh, at home in Irvine, in Irvine with partner Gary and their youngest daughter, two-year-old Riley. Leanne says her parents, grandparents and aunt and uncle popped over separately just to briefly hand in gifts for Myla. Now, to be fair, the rules did change again recently and Leanne admits that she missed the update. To be fair, even if she caught the update, like many people, she may well have still been confused about it. She said she missed the most recent restrictions update due to a lot going on in her personal life and assumed she was still allowed one household at a time indoors. She said, I honestly didn't know the rules had changed. I missed all that. We weren't planning to have people over or anything. My grandparents popped in for 15 minutes with a present for her, then they left. After they left, my aunt and uncle came over to drop a gift off. My aunt did pop in to see Myla quickly, but my uncle basically stayed outside and a wee while later, my mum and dad came over and my mum nipped in to see Myla's balloons, but that was it. The next thing I knew, the police were at the door saying someone had reported me for having six adults and six kids in my house at the same time, which is just absolutely did not happen. Leanne said she is genuinely sorry for the mishap and says it has left her feeling scared of another accidental breach. She said, I am sorry we broke the rules. It wasn't our intention. They were not all inside and they weren't all here at the same time and we all kept a social distance. But to be honest, the rules are so confusing and keep changing, it's hard to keep up. It feels like we are totally losing all of our freedoms to this virus and it feels a bit like they are making it up as they go along. I'm scared now in case it happens again and I get prosecuted. There are people out there actually committing serious crimes and there aren't enough place to deal with it. But if I have my mum round again, I will get charged. I could have booked a restaurant with my parents for Myla's birthday and sat at a table for a couple of hours with them. And that would have been legal. But they nip into my house for 15 minutes to wish their grandchild a happy birthday. And I could have the police at my door. It's pretty unbelievable. But I know we did break the rules and I'm sorry for that. But I genuinely thought we were still allowed one other f household inside. But of course, rather than a friendly word, the police go in with threats and intimidation, putting the mum on the police's COVID watch list. One thing that gets me is that anyone can report a breach and the police will almost inevitably turn up, even if the complaint is a malicious one. But there is no protection for people who have been maliciously reported by tosspot neighbours who think by grassing up their neighbours, the double S will come and give them a few squares of chocolate. I'm not for a moment saying that breaking genuine rules or laws is a good thing, it's not. But these are guidance that's been put into legislation, giving it the force of law and making our rights unlawful or illegal, which cannot be allowed to continue. Lawbreakers, genuine lawbreakers who cause harm, loss or damage to another person should be dealt with. People who make their own decision to meet with family or are doing so knowingly that the flu is about. And so if there's a risk, they put themselves at risk by agreeing to meet. It's not a criminal matter and should not be dealt with as such. Children across the country are seeing firsthand the double S behaviour of the police and government and will, without doubt, rebel against them as they get older, remembering the time the police gate crashed their birthday and threatened their parents. London Rail staff are now being accompanied by police at stations and on trains in order to enforce the face mask regulations. The pilot scheme is being run on services by South Eastern, Southern Thameslink and Great Northern running until November the 22nd. 
mainstream media using their influence to frighten people with the mention of the maximum fines rather than the fines as they are in increments by simply saying that people who refuse to wear a mask unless exempt will face a fine of up to £6,400. The problem is, even if someone is exempt, the police have already been seen to ignore that fact and simply accuse, intimidate, frighten and threaten people, and in some cases, assault them. Actually, where on earth are they finding the additional police to accompany rail staff when there's such a lack of police numbers at the moment to already deal with real crimes? Chief Superintendent Martin Fry of British Transport Police said, we know that the majority of people want to do the right thing and comply with the law, playing their part in protecting each other by wearing face coverings, not only on trains, but also in stations. Those who do not comply with the law or are exempt have no need to worry. Really? However, there is a minority who deliberately flaunt the law. This not only needlessly makes passengers nervous about travelling, it puts lives at risk. Does it though? If you are wearing a mask, doesn't that protect you? I know it's said that wearing a mask is more about protecting other people, but unless I'm completely stupid, the masks don't have a one-way valve on them, only allowing particles to not to leave the confines of the face nappy pretty sure that if they're effective in stopping viral particles from exiting then it should be pretty effective in stopping viral particles from entering so if you're wearing a mask are you not safe nottingham police were not best pleased recently as they tried to pursue a learner driver through the courts for stopping just over the line at a set of traffic lights where the judge gave the defendant an absolute discharge 18-year-old Joseph Bell was having a driving lesson when he stopped over the line at a junction on the Colwick Loop Road in Nottingham on 14th of December last year and was caught on a traffic light camera. The camera recorded that he was just over the line for a total of 14.8 seconds with no oncoming cars or pedestrians present. However, police pursued this wanton act of defiance to the courts, loving the fact that the cost doesn't come out of their pockets. Joseph fully admitted failing to comply with the red light, but Nottingham magistrates accepted special circumstances. Bruce Stewart, defending Mr Bell, said the car would not have presented a danger to other road users if there had been traffic. He said if the car had been travelling at speed, this would have been recorded on the camera and any sign of danger would have seen the driving instructor, instructor moved into action. If there was a danger, he would have stopped the car, he said. This is something that learner drivers do. They make mistakes. Mr Bell's driving instructor wrote a letter supporting his student, telling the magistrates that it was a simple lapse of judgment that can happen on occasions with student drivers. In granting an absolute discharge, Mr Bell will not have any points put on his driving licence or have to pay any costs. Well done, Magistrate Richard Eaton. It's a shame more of you can't spot malicious prosecutions and deal with them appropriately. Magistrate Richard Eaton said the incursion into the junction was minimal and would have been nowhere near traffic if the road had been busy. Inspector Simon Allen from Nottinghamshire Police defended, of course, the, police, the force's actions over the case, saying there is no mitigation for learner drivers when committing a traffic offence and it was the job of officers to uphold the law. The safety of all road users is paramount, which is why the law holds learner drivers equally accountable and they must ensure that they follow the rules of the road, he said. In these cases, drivers have a choice to take a ticket or go to court, as happened here. Oh, go cry a river to your chief super, Inspector Allen. Maybe if you hadn't forgotten that people do make genuine mistakes and providing those mistakes don't cause harm loss or damage to another person, then you should maybe be a bit more human about it, especially seeing the driving at some police constables display. Lancashire Police Chief Constable Andy Rhodes has been moaning this week about how police constables are exhausted, suggesting that exhausted police officers are becoming the accepted norm after dealing with regular crime on top of challenges faced with the lockdown and coronavirus. Sounds like an admission that coronavirus lockdown offences aren't a crime. Now, I do understand that police have had a fair bit to deal with this year, some COVID-related stuff aside, Black Lives Matter protests, counter demonstrations, Extinction Rebellion marches, the anti-lockdown demonstrations and street parties. 
have all occurred this year, which I do get, can be a strain. It's just a shame that the police make things worse for themselves by instigating problems at these events rather than trying to deal with it normally. Many police constables also claim that they're having to face the brunt of the public's anger over the government's handling of COVID-19. Well, here's an idea for you. Stop trying to enforce unenforceable guidance. Refuse to enforce unenforceable guidance and tell the government to stick it up Boris's Harris. What's he going to do? You know, but no, it's not going to happen because the narcissistic nature of being a police constable prevents you from taking action that will see peace and community return to the country. Instead, keeping it divided by fighting against everyone gives you a purpose to get up in the morning. Chief Constable Rhodes claims that more than half of constables surviving on fewer than six hours of sleep a night and feel fatigued. He said in terms of fatigue, PCs were the worst affected. Half had less than six hours of sleep a night. All of them talked about sleep disruption from being on call. I believe fatigue is the next big thing after mental health issues. And we need to reduce the stigma about fatigue as it is kind of accepted that everyone is exhausted. In a countrywide police welfare survey in which they could report any concerns, it was determined that, now get ready for this, 67% of police officers and 50% of police staff had reported suffering with some form of post-traumatic stress disorder and that one in five constables had experienced a complex form of PTSD. But are yet are still working dealing with the public. Now let's just take a quick look as to why that's such a bad thing because clearly the police haven't yet got round to reading the NHS website symptoms for PTSD and correlated that giving PTSD sufferers weapons is no doubt one of the reasons for all of the police complaints that you fail to uphold. Or the overreactions we see from many police constables up and down the country. Re-experiencing. Re-experiencing is the most typical symptom of PTSD. This is where a person involuntarily and vividly relives a traumatic event in the form of flashbacks, nightmares, repetitive and distressing images or sensations, physical sensations such as pain, sweating, feeling sick or trembling. Some people have constant negative thoughts about their experience, repeatedly asking themselves questions that prevent them from coming to terms with the event. For example, they may wonder why the event happened to them and if they could have done anything to stop it, which can lead to feelings of guilt or shame. All symptoms that could result in very bad judgment and very wrongful actions against a member of the public. Avoidance and emotional numbing. Trying to avoid being reminded of a traumatic event is another key symptom of PTSD. This usually means avoiding certain people or places that remind you of the trauma or avoiding talking to anyone about your experiences. Many people with PTSD try to push memories of the event out of their mind, often distancing themselves with work or hobbies. Some people attempt to deal with their feelings by trying not to feel anything at all. This is known as emotional numbing. This can lead to the person becoming isolated and withdrawn, and they may also give up pursuing activities they used to enjoy. Emotional numbing meaning a lack of understanding about their actions, the impact they could have on the public. Hyperarousal, feeling on edge. Someone with PTSD may be very anxious and find it difficult to relax. They may be constantly aware of threats and easily startled. This state of mind is known as hyperarousal. Hyperarousal often leads to irritability, angry outbursts, sleeping problems, insomnia, difficulty concentrating. I don't even think I need to comment on this one, but irritability, angry outbursts, exactly what we want from impartial keepers of the law, isn't it? Other problems. Many people with PTSD also have a number of other problems, including other mental health problems such as depression, anxiety or phobias, self-harming or destructive behaviours such as drug misuse or alcohol misuse, other physical symptoms such as headaches, dizziness, chest pains and stomach aches. PTSD sometimes leads to work-related problems and the breakdown of relationships. Now you tell me if you think giving people with PTSD weapons and the almost immune power they wield over people is a bright idea. Chief Constable Rhodes said on the plus side, oh there's a plus side, 65% feel they have enough autonomy to do the job while reflecting their values and beliefs 
and about 90% reported having huge pride in their work. And that's autonomy. We don't want robots. We want police working. We don't want police working on autopilot. We want and need police who are going to use their best judgment, not simply arrest people because it's the autonomous thing to do and then be protected by their blue line brothers in the fallout. My word. Custody Sergeant Matt Retana was killed last week, as we all know. But more information is coming out about the man responsible, Louis de Zoyza. And it seems that some of the mainstream media is using their brains for change and pointing out things that I've been saying about the incident. Louis, who is said to have autism, seems to have been brought up in a relatively decent household. He lived with his parents in South London with his yoga teacher dad and local Green Party activist and former election candidate mother and his Oxford University student brother and sister. The Times reported that his dad, Chana de Zoyza, is listed online as a yoga teacher, originally from Sri Lanka, and once ran a free bike repair workshop in Croydon. His wife Elizabeth was born in Croydon, runs a translation firm specialising in Dutch to English work, and once ran as a local Green Party councillor for the borough. His younger brother John is doing a master's degree at Oxford University, where he is the head of the Sri Lankan society. As you would expect, since the incident, friends and neighbours have come forward to tell how strange the person was. A childhood friend is allegedly, has allegedly said, I knew he was a troubled kid, very awkward, very serious for some reason. Lona, who lived with his parents and was described as having a respectable but unstable upbringing. A nearby resident of the 23 year old said he was always very awkward, always to himself. One said, I don't think he had many friends. He was probably a bit of a loner. It was reported that de Zoyza was flagged to the Home Office's Prevent Organisation for de-radicalisation de uh, two years ago over claims he held Islamist and far-right views, but was allegedly assessed as posing no threat. On Friday morning, the 25th of September, de Zoyza was allegedly stopped and searched by two special constables for possession of ammunition and drugs. There's your first seed planted right there. Blame the specials and say they didn't have the experience or some other BS. If it was specials and they searched him because they already believed that he had ammunition, then a firearms unit should have been deployed to stop and search him instead. He was arrested outside Anderson Heights in Norbury at around 1.44 in the morning and then taken to custody centre in Windmill Lane, where he remained handcuffed until the door was opened for him to be searched with a metal detector. The source has said that he was cuffed behind his back and given a pat down. It would appear the suspect has somehow managed to conceal the gun on his body. However, there are rules preventing any intimate body searches on the street. It can only be done when a suspect is booked into a custody suite. The source added the sergeant opened the door to admit him and take his temperature to comply with COVID rules. But the suspect shot him at point blank range. Now, looking at this image, which is believed to be how the weapon was fired and where it could have been concealed. I said already that the weapon must have been near his waistband as he wouldn't have been able to reach further down into his trousers. As police were handcuffing him, they should have been able to feel the weapon during a search. Checking the waistband of the trousers is not classed as an intimate search and happens all the time. Feeling the rear pockets of a suspect in a search is not classed as intimate search as it happens all the time on the streets. So someone, please tell me, how the hell did this guy manage to get searched, handcuffed, taken to the police station without anyone knowing he had a weapon in his pants? Don't be rude. It was said that even from this angle, the custody sergeant was shot several times in the heart before allegedly, during the struggle, he managed to shoot himself in the neck. They just put your hands behind your back in a cuffed position and try to pretend you have a gun and see if you can aim it to your neck without shooting through any other part of your body while in a struggle with several police. Sadly, Sergeant Ratana died and police launched a murder cover-up uh, investigation. I personally hope that police don't cover up their mistakes as it will be disrespectful towards Sergeant Ratana's loss of life, but although most people would feel the same way as I do about that, I'm sure those in charge will do anything they can to take the blame from them, put it on someone else. Please don't get me wrong, I am certainly not condoning the actions of Desoyza in any way. Clearly a cretinous POS in the first place to be carrying a gun, if he had a gun, and he deserves all he gets, if that's the case. But I fear this will be another life discarded by the police in their ever-increasing repertoire of failures. 
The Metropolitan Police have allegedly been ordered to open inquiry by a court after they heard that escaped prisoner up from Udim, who walked out of an open prison on June the 17th to see his mother, tried to hand himself into police seven times, but police failed to arrest him. Akram, who had been jailed for firearms offences, spent a month trying to hand himself in to officers, but was repeatedly turned away. He admitted to absconding from an open prison to see his mother on the 17th of June. His lawyers told his sentencing hearing on Friday that seven times he asked police to arrest him, and seven times they refused. This case, more than any other I have heard or have been involved with in my last two decades of practice, perhaps illustrates the extent of the managed decay of the criminal justice system, Hoodin's lawyer Liam Walker of Doherty Street Chambers told Maidstone Crown Court on Friday. Several attempts Udin and his solicitor made to have him voluntarily taken back into custody at a South East London police station were documented by a solicitor. His first attempt was on July the 13th, but was turned away by police, Walker told the court, adding that his client was told to go back to the police station six days later. One day before that, however, he was eventually arrested. It is utterly astonishing that when Mr Udin asked to be taken back into custody, he was refused. There is little more that an escaped prisoner can do than instruct his solicitor that he is going to a particular police station, attend the police station with a bag, say he has escaped from prison, give his full details and ask to be arrested and taken back, Walker told the court. The judge, Charles Greatwick, demanded that the Met Police conduct an inquiry and present its findings to the court within 28 days. He told Udin he had no reason to doubt that he made efforts to hand himself in, though he made no observation in relation to the chronology his lawyers outlined. Udin was jailed for four months for absconding from prison. A Met Police spokesman said, We are aware of claims made in mitigation during the sentencing of Akram Udin at Maidstone Crown Court on Friday the 18th of September. After being made aware of the comments made in court, we are conducting a review to establish the facts of these claims. If an individual attended a police station in a metropolitan police area to confirm they are wanted for a criminal offence, their name would be put through the police national computer to confirm this. Even if that person isn't wanted, there would be a record of that name having been entered. And by who? From an initial review of our system, there is no record of an Akram Udin having attended Lewisham Police Station on dates between the 13th of July and 13th of August. Appropriateadult.org.uk, a registered charity aiming to ensure the rights of well and welfare of the most vulnerable people of society by developing effective appropriate adults, has published a report after a series of freedom of information requests, which show that hundreds of thousands of vulnerable suspects last year in England and Wales were detained and interviewed by police in breach of mandatory safeguards. Failures by police to provide an appropriate adult to people with mental illness, autism or learning disabilities leaves those people at risk of miscarriage of justice, suicide and self-harm. Using data obtained by Freedom of Information Request, the charity found that although clinical interviews showed 39% of adult suspects in police custody have a mental disorder, the police recorded a need for an appropriate adult to be present in just 6.2% of detentions and 3.5% of voluntary interviews. Local variation was found to be huge with rates at some police forces at just 0.1%. Chris Bath, Chief Executive of the National Appropriate Adult Network, said this meant vulnerable people could have been detained and interviewed 327,000 times without the support the government had agreed was necessary to ensure fairness and protect the legal rights of interviewees and vulnerable suspects. He added if, if officers fail to secure the support of appropriate adults, they risk making evidence unreliable. When this is raised in courts by lawyers, prosecutions can be abandoned at significant waste of time and expense. Our report reinforces calls for the Home Office to create a statutory duty on local authorities or another independent body to provide help for vulnerable adults in police stations. In August 2018, the Home Office made significant updates to rules regarding vulnerable suspects and the presence of appropriate adults after asking the National Appropriate Adult Network to look at the issue. The charity has now completed its assessment of whether the changes have improved the situation and Bath said the findings were disappointing. The sad fact is that the changes have made no significant difference at all. The report also found that less than one in five people identified by NHS Liaison and Diversion Services who operate in police custody to identify vulnerable people have been given an appropriate adult by police. Among the 55,301 adult liaison and diversion among the 55,301 adult liaison and diversion service clients who did not have an appropriate adult, 
68% had one or more mental health issues, while 15% were at current risk of suicide or self-harm. It is hard to understand why anyone that vulnerable is not deemed to be in need of an appropriate adult, said Bath. Martin Underhill, the Dorset Police and Crime Commissioner, who speaks for the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners on Police Custody, said this latest report from the National Adult the National Appropriate Adult Network is a sobering and disappointingly familiar read. He said, unfortunately, the evidence collected by Nan clearly demonstrates once again how vulnerable people entering police custody are, still not receiving the necessary support. This is neither in the interest of police, suspects nor victims and can undermine public confidence in policing and the wider justice system. There is still clear need for the government to determine through legislation a responsible agency to deliver appropriate adults for vulnerable people aged 18 and over and to provide ring-fenced funding for the delivery of these resources. Shocking figure, but not at all surprising. Cheshire police dog handler, 41-year-old PC Alan Friday from Liverpool, has been charged with harassment and has now been suspended from duties. Cheshire police have confirmed that PC Friday has been suspended from his role due to an ongoing case. A Merseyside police spokesman said we can confirm that a Halewood man has been charged with harassment as part of an ongoing investigation. 41-year-old Alan Friday of Yuchi Road was charged in June 30, was charged in June this year. He is on conditional bail to appear next at Wigan and Lee Magistrates Court on Friday, December 4th. Very big thank you to channel supporters, one and all, especially the channel patron supporters. Your support is truly appreciated and really goes a long way to help. And that is all I have for you today. Please like, please share, please comment and please subscribe. Let me know your thoughts, as I know many of you will. And of course, till next time, stay safe, look after each other, film the police and other officials. Good night, all. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the content and you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so. In the description of every video, there are some links to ways that you're able to help support the channel so I can continue putting out content. If you're unable to help us in that way, hit that subscribe button up the top there. If you haven't already, become a subscriber. That is support enough. Share the videos, comment, like, it all helps. If you're looking for something else to watch, up top there is my latest video. Down the bottom there is a video that YouTube recommends for you.